أزكيا وأصحابه لتقيا أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيذكم لعلكم تذكرون صدق الله العظيم Before we start today's session inshallah as we were students once our teacher asked a question it was actually a riddle that Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu once asked the, asked the other companions that were around him. And the reason why the riddle comes to mind today is that because the answer to the riddle actually comes into the, the, the part of the, the, the part of Sila we're covering today. The riddle goes that Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu as he says, that who is the person who did not pray salah his entire life? His entire life the person, he did not pray a single salah. But yet, he was one of the first to enter into paradise. So who was the person who his entire life did not pray a single salah? He was such, his state was such that till a part, till a part that he even disliked praying salah. And yet, what happened? He was one of the first people to enter into paradise. Who was this person? So we'll cover that today, just to keep that in mind, the question in mind, let's see if someone figures it out. So khayt. Now, previously, last week, what we discovered, what we covered was the, the year of huzn, the year of grief of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The three weird incidents that took place in that year. Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he passed away. The wife of the Prophet ﷺ, Hazrat Khadija radiallahu anha, she passed away. And then after this, the Prophet ﷺ, he also visited the valley of Taif, and then he was rejected from there. And after these these grave incidents took place in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He rewarded the Prophet ﷺ with the miracle of Mi'raj, when the Prophet ﷺ, he traveled from Makkah Mukarramah to Bayt al-Maqdis in, in, in Jerusalem. And from Jerusalem, he went to meet Allah, he went to, he went to um, the Arsh al and he conversed with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was given the gift of, he was given three gifts. One of the three gifts, which was one of the major gifts was the gift of, um, the, the gift of, of salah. The second gift was the last verses of Surah Baqarah. And the third gift was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He promised the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that any person who accepted, accepted the kalima, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, and he passed away with this kalima, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised that person paradise. So these were the three gifts that were given to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that night. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he came back from Mi'raj, what happened was, the Prophet sallallahu began to invite people towards Islam again. He began to tell people that, look, this is the great miracle Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me with. Look how great of a miracle this is. But what happened, the people, instead of accepting the Prophet of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa they carried on rejecting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa They were insisting on their, uh, on their arrogance. And they refused to accept the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So now what happened was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he awaited the season of Hajj. Because in the season of Hajj, you have to understand, the Kaaba was the center point. And people from all different corners of the world would come for Hajj. And it was a unique crowd, different crowd. It wasn't the same old people who were, who were stuck to their point, their view, that they weren't going to change whatever happened. So the Prophet ﷺ was now waiting for people to come from outside Makkah Mukarramah. And when the people came from outside of Makkah Mukarramah during the season of Hajj to perform their Hajj, the Prophet ﷺ <laughs> began to call people towards Islam. He would walk through the streets, find new people, find other caravans that were coming in, note them down, go and visit them, make it a point, as we would refer to it in our common day as gush. He would go and visit them. One by one, he would go visit these people and say, come to the path of Allah, come to the path of Allah. He would call them to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he was doing this, and now what happened was, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his name was Abu Lahab. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses this individual by saying, tabbat yada abi lahab wa ta'ala. So this Abu Lahab, what he, what he started doing was, he left all of his occupation, he left everything behind, and he made it his priority to reject the Prophet ﷺ. So where the Prophet ﷺ was calling to the oneness of Allah, a few feet behind the Prophet ﷺ was walking Abu Lahab, and he was telling everyone that this person is insane, this person is, this person is a magician, this person, he has no sense to what he's saying, he's deviating from the teachings of our, of our forefathers. And he was calling against the Prophet ﷺ, while the Prophet ﷺ, just a few steps ahead, was calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now there are many many different tribes there. So it comes in the books of the hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he comes to one tribe. He tells the people there that accept Islam. So it was a very powerful, very strong, and you know powerful tribe. So these people said to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that we will accept. But if we accept and we help you in war against these people of Makkah Mukarramah, and we defeat them and we conquer Makkah Mukarramah, you have to promise that you'll make us the Khalifa of Makkah Mukarramah. You have to promise that you'll make us the ruler of Makkah Mukarramah. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that if it was my ruling I would give it to you. But I only do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered me to do. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to make you the Khalifa, then be it so. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refuses that you should be the Khalifa, and Allah decides someone else to be the Khalifa, someone else to be the ruler, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes for his Prophet to rule, 
the lands of Islam during his life, then I will be the ruler. So at this, the people said to the Prophet wasallam that that makes no sense. That we are the ones who fight, we are the ones who put our life on the line, and you take the, and you take the rule. And you're the one who rules everything. So the Prophet wasallam told them, well look, I'm not bargaining as if this is, some, this is some product, and I'm trying to sell you a product. This is the truth. If you want to accept, you accept. If you don't want to accept, leave. So now the Prophet wasallam he stood up from these people, along with Abu Bakr and Umar Ali radiallahu anh, and he came to this tribe um, by the name of Qabila Banu Dhuh. When he came to this tribe, there was a person sitting there by the name of Mafruq. He was one of the leaders of this tribe. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he came to this individual. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was also with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu this time in this at, at this instance of of tabligh of this at, at this instance of da'wah, Abu, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu he took the initiative to call this Mafruq towards Islam. So he says to this Mafruq that do you know who Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is? Have you heard of this individual? So the person says yes, I have heard of him. Everyone's talking about him. So then he says to this Mafruq that. Why don't you accept Islam? He says, well, I've never had the chance to meet him one-on-one. I've heard about him and that's it. So the Prophet wasallam, that was sitting behind Abu Bakr Siddiq, عنه, he steps ahead and begins to speak to Mafruq. And he says to him, I call towards the oneness of Allah. The people of Quraysh, they reject and they will, have to, they will be punished and they will have to answer to Allah for every time they reject the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he recited the verse, Wallahu huwa al al hamid That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is the characteristic of Allah? What is, one of, what is one of the sifat of Allah? Allah is ghani. What does ghani mean? Ghani, t- typically, if you look at a dictionary and you open it up, Arabic dictionary, the translation for ghani you'll find is someone rich. The opposite of faqir. So you say ghani, faqir, ghani adni, a rich person, faqir adni, a poor person. So in Arabic, the word ghani typically means a person who's rich. But the word, the reason why a ghani in Arabic is actually called, uh, is referred to as a rich person, is because, is because the actual meaning of ghani is a person who is not dependent to anyone else. A ghani is the one who is not dependent towards anyone else. He doesn't need anyone else. What, is, uh, what does the Prophet ﷺ say? That such a beautiful person is a scholar, that he benefits everyone with his knowledge, but at the same time, he's not dependent to anyone else. The Prophet ﷺ, he praises knowledge by saying, how beautiful is the knowledge? That everyone is dependent towards him, but at the same time, he's ghani from everyone, he doesn't need anyone else. So this is a ghani, a ghani is a person who doesn't need anyone. And when a person becomes wealthy, he no longer needs to go and beg at the people, therefore, and then if in one aspect, he's independent. So therefore, a rich person in Arabic is referred to as ghani. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, him, to himself, he refers to himself in the Qur'an as, Wallahu huwa al-ghani. Meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am ghani. Now this verse is so powerful, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, that Allah is independent. Allah does not need anyone. The human being, what does he think? The human being thinks that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs our worship. What does a human being think? That by reading salah, I'm actually doing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a favor. The human being, what does he think? By coming to the masjid and taking time for leaving my family and leaving my house behind, stepping out of my lazy little circle and coming into the masjid, I'm actually doing Allah a favor. By reading a few pages every single day, by reading a few ahadith every single day, by doing a few small things every now and then, what does a human being think? That I am doing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a favor. But what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the hadith al-Qudsi? لَوْ أَنَّ أَوَّلَكُمْ وَآخِرَكُمْ وَإِنْسَكُمْ وَجِنَّكُمْ كَانُوا عَلَىٰ كَانُوا عَلَىٰ أَدْقَىٰ قَلْبِ رَجْلٍ وَاحِدٍ مِنْكُمْ مَا زَادَ ذَلِكَ مِنْ مُلْكِهِ شَيْئًا Then if the first of you, the last of you, the ins and the jinnat. So just imagine, calculate how many people that is. The first and the last, from the time of Adam a.s. till the end. Not only the human being, that's insan. Okay, imagine how many insan, how many billions of insan that is, how many billions of human beings that is, okay? So from the first till the end, all the human beings, if they all gather together. And if all of them, only the human beings, multiply by the jinnats too. All the jinnats from beginning, past, before, before shaitan, before Jibreel alayhi salam, the very first, not Jibreel alayhi salam is an angel, but the first jinn ever created. If all of the jinn and the insan were ever gathered together, and they all became like the most pious person on the face of this earth, if they were all given the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if they were all given the actions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? مَا زَادَ ذَلِكَ مِن مُلْكِهِ شِيَةً All of this will not increase Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need anyone. وَاللَّهُ هُوَ الْغَنِي Allah is the one who is poor. Allah is the one who is rich. Allah is independent. وَأَنْتُمُ الْفَقَرَاءَ And then Allah says, you are the ones that are dependent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want your paradise, if you want to be successful, if you want to be amongst those people who Allah will be pleased with in the hereafter, then it's your job to go and beg Allah. Then stop being a king and for once turn into a slave. So this is what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is telling these people. That don't think that if these people are rejecting Allah, that Islam is going to be weak. Or Allah subhanahu wa taala, na'udhu billahi min dhalik, will become any poor or any weak. That can never happen. 
Wallahu huwa al-ghaniyu al-hamid. Allah is independent. Allah doesn't need anyone at all. So now this mafruq says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then what is your message? Tell me. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he begins to recite the beautiful verses of Surah Anam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to tell the people, قُلْ تَعَالَوْا O people, gather together, come. أَتْلُ مَا حَرَّمَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ أَلَّا تُشْرِكُوا بِشَيْئًا That I call to you, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram on you, that you worship anyone except for Allah. Don't worry, don't worship anyone except for Allah. And then the second responsibility of yours is to be nice with your parents, to be kind to your parents, to be honest to your parents, to be grateful to your parents, to always thank your parents. بِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا That your relationship with your parents should be on the level of ihsan. Now ihsan is the highest level of worship. Every ibadah, the highest level of ibadah is, is what we refer to as ihsan. Always remember this term. The highest level of any ibadah is what we refer to as ihsan. A person once came to Mana Zakari rahmatullah alayhi. Mana Zakari rahmatullah alayhi, the famous, his famous book that he wrote, um, this, Farah al-Amal. Mana Zakari rahmatullah alayhi was a very unique individual. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed this person with such knowledge and such piety and such virtue that it's hard to sometimes even find people that can ever match this individual. Now this isn't my word, someone may be thinking, okay, you know, a person is just overpraising someone. There was a scholar, a Maliki scholar in Makkah Mukarramah. Makkah or Madinah Munawar, I can't remember correctly. I think in Makkah Mukarram. His name was Sheikh Alawi Al Maliki. He was from Saudi. His name was Sheikh Alawi Al Maliki. He was from the Maliki fiqh. He lived in the he lived in the Arabian subcontinent. So he used to refer to Mala Zakari Rahmatullah Ali, who was a, who was originally from India, and later on in his life he migrated to Madinah Munawara. This great Maliki scholar, he referred to Mala Zakari Rahmatullah Ali as Abi. Whenever he met Mala Zakari Rahmatullah Ali, he used to call him my father. He used to refer to this individual as my father. And he used to say to Mu'ana Zakaria Rahmatullah that this individual, Mu'ana Zakaria, is actually the Imam Malik of this time. What did he say? That he is the Imam Malik of this time. Now someone hears that, you think, wow, that's, a, that's some exaggeration. That someone is referring to a person living in the 14th century, in Hijri, as Imam Malik of this time. Then he used to go on to explain that why he was Imam Malik of this time. He says Imam Malik Rahmatullah wrote the famous Muatta Imam Malik. The famous book of Hadith, the very first of its kind that actually differentiated between Sahih and Da'if Hadith. Say, Imam Malik Rahmatullahi was the first to write this book. And the only person in history, as he says, that actually commentated on the book the way this book deserved to be commentated on was Imam Zakari Rahmatullahi. The Shaykh al Hadith, Imam Zakari Rahmatullahi. And then he says, Imam Zakari Rahmatullahi, not only this, Imam Malik Rahmatullahi, his love for Madinah Munawwara was so great that he refused to leave Madinah Munawwara. And he only left Madinah Munawwara how many times in his life? Once. And that was to perform Hajj. He says, likewise, Mana Zakari Rahmatullah his love for Madinah Munawwara became so strong at the end of his life that he also passed through in Madinah Munawwara too. Imam Malik Rahmatullah was born, was buried in Jannatul Baqi. He says, Shaykh Zakari Rahmatullah was also buried in Jannatul Baqi. And then he says, Imam Malik Rahmatullah he was buried next to his teacher Nafi. He was buried at the feet of his teacher Nafi. Mana Zakari Rahmatullah was also buried at the feet of his teacher Mana Khalil Ahmad Saharampudi Rahmatullah so this was a very great individual, a very knowledgeable individual. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed this person with great amounts of knowledge. So now, Mala Zakari Rahmatullahi, once a person came to his gathering. He lived in a small village, Saharanpur. This individual came to him and he said to Mala Zakari Rahmatullahi, that I have a question for you. I'm actually passing by Saharanpur. I'm not actually, I didn't come to visit you, I'm actually passing by. But I had a question, so I'll give you the question and I'll go to where I'm going. And I'll return back to my destination. Three days later, I'll come back and I want an answer after three days. So basically, he was asking the question and he said, I'll give you three days to think about the answer. You can answer me after three days. So the question was, he said to Mala Zakari Rahmatullahi, what is the sof? What was the question? What is the sof? A very common question. Many of us, when we hear the word, we're scared, we're terrified. That the sof, what is the sof? So he put this question in front of Mala Zakari Rahmatullahi. He said, I'll give you three days. Think about a very good answer. When I come back, give me a convincing answer. Something that actually, you know, convinces me to, to believe that, you know, the soul is something good and not something corrupted. So now, when he's leaving, Mala Zakar Rahmatullah said, Oh, bhaiya, idhar aye. So, oh, brother, come here. There's no need to give me three days. Let me give you the answer right now. He says, the ibtida of the soul is, there's always the beginning and the end of everything. So, for example, if you go to, you know, if you go for an alim course, when I studied my alim course, the beginning of the alim course, my teacher said to us, was to learn the Urdu language, the curriculum that we studied. And the ending of the alim course was to finish off Sahih al-Bukhari. So there's always a beginning and an end. 
So for example, if a person goes to learn how to play basketball, probably I'm assuming, the first day they teach you how to ba ba um, you know, bounce the ball. And the last day, the day you're per you, you reach perfection, is the day you can score 100 points in your game. That's the day of perfection, for example. So there's always a beginning and an end. The child, he comes to the Qari Sahib the first day to learn his Qur'an. And his beginning is, Surah Fatiha, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And the ending is when he finishes off, Qul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Nas, Malikin Nas. When he finishes off, Minal Jannati Wal Nas, that's his end. So now he says to this person that there's always a begin and an ending to everything. The beginning to the soul is, Innamal A'malu Bin Niyat. That learn how to work on your intentions. That your focus in your goal is always on your intentions, not always on your deeds. Your deeds are there. But those deeds will be most weighty on the Day of Judgment, which have correct intentions. Look at the lady, Sahih al-Bukhari, the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, who committed zina, she committed adultery all of her life. She committed adultery all of her life, and she sees a thirsty dog by the well, she takes her sock off, she fills the sock up with water, and she feeds it to the, daughter, to the dog, and what happens? What happens to the lady? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants her jannah. How many, days, how many good deeds did she do in her life? Very few. She was a lady who committed adultery. Imagine how big the sin is to that altogether. She was a prostitute. She committed adultery all of her life. And once and she had mercy for the creation of Allah, her intention was correct. She did something with a good intention. What happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted her paradise. So he says to this individual, that the beginning of the soul is to think about your intentions. You're always thinking about your intentions, your intentions, your intentions. When I come to the masjid, what's the purpose of this? When I come to the lecture, what's the purpose? If I'm delivering the lecture, what's the purpose? If I'm listening to someone, what's the purpose? If I'm helping someone, what's the purpose? If I read the Qur'an, what's the purpose? If I smile to my father, what's the purpose? If I do anything right or wrong, what's the purpose to what I'm doing? Is it to please Allah? If the pleasure of Allah is the actual purpose, then indeed a person is successful. But if at the same time, the same deed was done for anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to that person, on the day of judgment, that go and seek a reward for him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no reward for you. You never did the reward for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the person you did the reward for. Go and ask him if he can pay you back. If he can pay you back, find your reward by him. If he can't pay you back, then you have no reward by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said to the person, that the first and the beginning step to the soul is, إِنَّمَلْ أَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّةِ Working on your intentions. And then he said, the last brick in the finish line of the soul is, that you reach the level of ihsan. أن تعبد الله كأنك ترى فإن لم تكن ترى فإنه يراك. That you reach the level of perfection of intentions. That now when you worship Allah, as the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم himself he defines what إحسان is. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم himself he defines what إحسان is. He says the Jibril عليه السلام came to the gathering. The very famous hadith. Jibril عليه السلام came to the gathering. He asked the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم four questions. The third question he asked the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was he asked the Wamal إحسان. What is إحسان? What is perfection? What we're discussing right now. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he defined ihsan by saying, "An ta'abud Allah ka anna ka tara fi illam ta kunta rahu fi innu yarak." That you reach such a level of purity in, te in intentions that when you worship Allah subhanahu wa taala, it's as if you're standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa taala. It's as if you can imagine and realize that yes, indeed, I am standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that if you can't imagine that you're standing in front of Allah while you're worshiping, fa illam ta kunta rahu. If the, if the reality is that you cannot see Allah when you're worshipping, meaning you can't imagine, if you can't bring yourself to that spiritual state, فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاك Then indeed Allah is definitely watching you. You can never hide from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Luqman Hakim, what did he say to his son? He said to his son, that if you want to sin, find a place to sin where Allah can't see you. If you can't find that place, then forget about sinning altogether. He said to his son, that only sin as much as the punishment of Allah you can bear. He said to his son, that only worship Allah as much as you need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you need Allah, then worship Allah. How much ever you need Allah, keep worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if the time comes where you think you no longer need Allah, then take a break. But that time should never come because if that time comes in our life where we think we no longer need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the, the question should be that we're still in the folds of Islam or not. So khair. So now the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in this, this verse, in which the Prophet is, refer, is relating to this mafruq. He says to him, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first thing He orders us is, do not make partners with Allah. The second thing, be kind to your parents. Now look how beautiful the teachings of Islam are. Look how beautiful they are. What is the first teaching after the oneness of Allah in the Quran ayat? Being kind to our parents. The most important thing. And then the Prophet ﷺ says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادُكُمْ مِنْ إِمْلَاقِ Don't kill your children out of fear of poverty. Don't do this family planning out of fear of poverty. If you fear for them, then who is the Allah that's feeding you? If Allah is feeding you today, then how dare you fear someone else? How dare you fear? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is feeding you today, that Allah is still alive today, He was alive tomorrow, and He will live forever and never die, even abadan. 
هو الأول هو الآخر. He is first, he is the end. There is no limits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Infinite. There are no beginning or no end to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will feed your children too. And then the Prophet sallallahu says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الْفَوَاحِشَ مَا ظَهْرَ مِنْهَا وَمَا بَطَنْ Do not go near to immoral things. And then he says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ Do not kill anyone unrightfully. The Prophet says, when he gives these words to this mafruq, this mafruq says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it seems as if your words are no human words, these are, these, are, these are divine verses. So he says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, feed me, for, feed me more from your, from, your, from, your, from, your, from, your, from your knowledge. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he then recites the verse, إِنَّ اللَّهِ يَمُنُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَيْتَعِذُ الْقُرْبَى وَإِنْهَانِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ الْبَغْرِ Again, teaching the morals of Islam. Now after, now the question is, you know, one of our teachers, he asked this question. Now on the Jummah, in the, in the Jummah khutbah, at the end of the Jummah khutbah, we all commonly hear the verse. Which verse do we hear? The verse that is recited right now. إِنَّ اللَّهِ يَمُنُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَيْتَعِذُ الْقُرْبَى وَإِنْهَانِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ الْبَغْ يَعِذُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ Now our teacher once asked us when we read this verse in tafsir, when we came to this verse in tafsir, our teacher asked us that what is the reason why we recite this verse in, in Jummah khutbah every week? What's the purpose behind it? The reason is that because in this verse, the complete character is taught. In these few words, a complete character is taught to a person. إِنَّ اللَّهِ يَمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He orders us to be just. Ihsan, Ihsan. We just, discussed what it, we just discussed what Ihsan was. Completion. The highest level of ibadah. وَيِتَعِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى To give to, our, to, to those that are close to us, our relatives. وَيَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغْضِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He prevents us from, from, he prevents us from immoral things, from wrong things, and from oppressing. يَعِذُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives you advice, so you learn from the advice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So khair, so when, now when he hears these verses, he says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that I'm ready to accept Islam, but the only problem is, I can't accept Islam until I take advice and consult my, my, the people of my tribe. At the same time, we have a treaty with the, with, the Rome, with the Persians, and unless I seek permission from the Persians, I can't, seek, I can't accept Islam. The Prophet ﷺ tells this person that you can seek advice from whoever you want. But let me tell you one thing, if you accept Islam today, tomorrow you will see the Persian, the Persian Empire fall to your feet. He says to the Prophet ﷺ, in any case, I can't accept Islam until I, until I consult my people. So the Prophet ﷺ, he stands up from there and he leaves this person. Now the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he's going from group to group in this in these days of Hajj. So he reaches another group of people. Now in this group of people he meets this person by the name of Abu Haysa, and he's with another person by the name of Iyas bin Muath. He meets these two individuals. Now the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam again begins to preach Islam again. Now this Iyas bin Muath, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says to him, accept Islam, accept Islam, accept Islam. He gives him the message, gives him the message, gives him the message. This person's heart becomes a little soft, and they become soft to the point where he thinks, you know what? I think this is the right thing and I'm going to accept Islam. So his partner, Abu Haysar that was there, he became so upset that he picked up pebbles and he threw it at his friend. And he said to him, never should, you have, never should the day come that you accept Islam. So this Abu, Abu Haysar, uh, now this Iyas bin Mu'ad, he returned back to Madinah Munawwara. And it comes in the narrations that before he passed away, the last moments while he was alive, he recited the kalima, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and he passed away. So now this person was also, he also felt, you know, accepted Islam, and he passed away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted this person paradise, inshaAllah. Now in the 11th year after Nabuwa, in the 11th year, now the, which was the year of grief? Amul Huzn, which year was this? Who remembers? Amul Huzn that we discussed last year, which year was this? This was the 10th year after Nabuwa. Which year was it? The 10th year after Nabuwa. The 7th year after Nabuwa till the 10th year after Nabuwa was the period where there was a boycott on the Muslims. We mentioned this, okay? There was a boycott on the Muslims, and the Muslims were asked to, they, they were all gathered together in the, in, the, in, the, in the yard of Abu Talib, Sha'ab Abu Talib. Now after the 10th year, that treaty, that, that basically that contract was torn apart, some insects came, they ate the contract up, and the only thing that remained was, Bismillah Allahumma, the name of Allah. In the 10th year, these three great incidents took place, the Prophet ﷺ then went to Mi'raj. Now in the 11th year of Nabuwa, what happened was the Prophet ﷺ, he was at the time of Hajj, he was calling people, you know, we just mentioned two, three incidents where he was going from tribe to tribe. There are so many incidents. But I was just mentioning one or two. Now what happened was the Prophet ﷺ was going to tribe to tribe. He came to this tribe by the name of Khazraj. Now this tribe of Khazraj was actually from Medina Munawwara. In Medina Munawwara, there were two famous tribes. One was Aus, the second was Khazraj. The two famous tribes in Medina Munawwara were Aus and, Aus and Khazraj. Aus and Khazraj. These were the two tribes in Medina Munawwara. Now these two tribes, they were idol worshippers. Along with these two tribes, there was a really big portions of Jews that lived in Medina Manawara too. The reason why these Jews lived in Medina Manawara was because they were searching for the place where the final and last prophet would be sent. 
So in their books, there was a description of the place where the final and last prophet would be sent. So they were looking for that place, looking for that place, looking for that place, and finally when they found Medina Munawwara with this description, they settled there. They were hoping that by us settling here, within our children will be born the final and last prophet. But little did they know, that nowhere was it mentioned that he would be born there, it was mentioned that he would be sent there. So now what, what happened was that these people, they were living in Medina Munawwara, these Jews, whenever they would have an argument or some quarrel with Aus and Khazraj, they would always tell Aus and Khazraj, that you guys can fight with us all you want to, but the last prophet is going to come soon, it seems the time has come, and as soon as he is born within us, we're going to ask him to pray, pray to Allah against you, and you're going to be disturbed like the people of Ad and Thamur that were destroyed before. So these people, all their life, they heard about this final prophet, final prophet, final prophet, and they were actually frightened. Now you know, when is the final prophet going to come, and when are we going to be destroyed? So now this tribe of Khazraj, they were in Makkah Mukarramah, they came for Hajj, and they bumped into the final prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa called them towards Islam. They heard everything, they were like, oh my God, we cannot be wrong. We've been hearing about this person, you know, from years, and we cannot be wrong, this is the final prophet. But they were happy that we met the final prophet before they did. So they accepted Islam right away. Without a second thought, the whole, all the people that were there, there were six of them there, they accepted Islam. And they told the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa give us permission, we'll go back to Medina Munawwara, and we will call everyone towards Islam. Now understand what, understand how big of a role, and how big of an incident this was in Islamic history. Before this day, everyone, was hiding. Before this day, everyone was being tortured. Before this day, the Prophet ﷺ was stoned in Taif. Before this day, there was so much struggle. And now finally, a group comes and they say to the Prophet ﷺ, that we're ready to accept Islam and we're going to go back and we're going to preach Islam. The Prophet ﷺ, he grants him permission, okay, go and preach Islam. They come back to Medina Munawwara. When they come back to Medina Munawwara, what happens now, they begin to call their people, everyone accept Islam, accept Islam, accept Islam. The next year in Hajj, which year was it now? The twelfth year of Nabuwa, which means twelve years after Iqra bismi rabbika ladi khalaq. What does this mean? Twelve years after Iqra bismi. How old was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at this time? Fifty-two. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given his prophet at what age? Forty, right? And how many years after Prophet is this? Twelve. So twelve plus forty is fifty-two. So now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is fifty-two years old and it's twelve years after Nabuwa. It's now against the season of Hajj. Now again, these people from Medina Munawwara come, but this time there's 12 of them. So now they're multiplying. First came 6, and now come 12. So the Prophet ﷺ, now these 12 people, they take bayat at the hands of the Prophet ﷺ, they accept Islam, and they, they, they take the pledge at the hands of the Prophet ﷺ, that they will never make partners with Allah again. A very long pledge they take at the hands of the Prophet ﷺ. Now this time, the Prophet ﷺ, he sees that these people are multiplying. So the Prophet ﷺ makes an investment in the people of Medina Munawwara. He sends two individuals with him. The first individual, his name was Abdullah ibn Umm Abdullah ibn Ummi Ummi Maktum. Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktum radiallahu ta'ala. Who is this individual? What was the famous verse that was revealed regarding him? Abasa wa tawalla anjahul a'ma. He came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when the leaders of Makkah Mukarramah were there. And when, the, when he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what happened? He turned away from him and he gave his intent, attention to the people of Makkah, to the Quraysh. What happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed the verses, Abasa wa tawalla anjahul a'ma. That how could you turn away just because a blind Muslim came to you? Your interest was in these people, that these people may not even accept Islam. That person, he has accepted Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ was, you know, he was, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him the adab, that you should pay attention to the believers first. So now what happened was, Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktum radiallahu anh, he first of all, the verses of Abbas wa ta'ala was revealed with regards to him. The Prophet ﷺ commonly referred to this Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktum radiallahu anh, as the one because of whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he basically taught him the adab. That because of him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he taught the Prophet on the adab, so the Prophet he actually respected Abdullah ibn Umayyah Maktum radiallahu ta'ala. The second thing regarding Abdullah ibn Umayyah Maktum radiallahu anh, he used to also give adhan during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. During the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there were three people who used to give adhan. There were three people who gave adhan. The first person was Hazrat Bilal radiallahu anh. The second was Abdullah ibn Umayyah Maktum radiallahu ta'ala. These two people gave adhan in Badina Munawwara. The second, the third person who gave Adhan, his name was Abu Mahvura. His name was Abu Mahvura. He gave Adhan in Makkah Mukarramah. So now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sends Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum radiallahu an, along with Musa'ab bin Umayr radiallahu ta'ala. He sends these two companions with the people of Madinah Munawwara, go back and teach them. So now they return back, Musa'ab bin Umayr radiallahu an, now you have to understand, this individual went through torture. This individual gives sacrifice. 
And a person, when he gives sacrifice for the sake of deen, then there's something different in his talk. Then he doesn't only speak from his tongue, then he speaks from emotion, and speaks from his heart. So this Musa bin Umair radiallahu anh, he was now the Imam of Medina Manawara. What was he? He was the Imam of Medina Manawara, and he began to call people towards Islam. Now he's calling everyone, calling everyone towards Islam. And what happens is that, slowly, slowly people are accepting, people are accepting, people are accepting. And the word of the Islam, in regard, the word of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, had spread through every single house of Medina Manawara. Every person somewhere, somehow had heard of it. And this Musa bin Umair radiallahu anh, he was giving lectures that were crashing people apart. Now one day Musa bin Umair radiallahu anh, after salah, he's leading the salah after salah, he sits down, he gives a lecture. And while giving the lecture, a great portion of Medina Manawara gathers around him. A great enormous crowd. Now there's one individual by the name of Usaid bin Hudayr. He comes to Musa bin Umair radiallahu anh, and he's really mad. He says, who do you think you are? You're not even from our community. You come from Makkah Mukarramah. You start giving these lectures, and you're deviating everyone from the straight path, from our religion, from, their, from the religion of their forefathers, their, you know, their, 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 their idol worshipping. So Musa bin Umair radiallahu anh, says, look, take it easy. Before you attack me or anything, why don't you take a few moments and listen to what I'm saying? So he agrees. He goes, okay, let me listen to what, what are you saying. Let's listen to it. So he recites a few verses of the, of, of the Qur'an, and before he realizes that person's heart, it melts away. And he accepts Islam right away. When he accepts Islam, he says, look, there's one more person, if he accepts Islam, Medina Munawwara will accept Islam. The entire Medina Munawwara will accept Islam. Or one more person left. But he says to Musa bin Umair radiallahu anh, that you can't go to him, because if you go to him, he'll just drop you out. I have to go to him. His name was Sa'ad bin Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala, who later on accepted Islam. So he goes to Sa'ad bin Mu'ad. Sa'ad bin Mu'ad, when he sees this, um, this, 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 um, this, um, um, this uh, um, Usaid bin Hudayr radiallahu, Usaid bin Hudayr radiallahu an, he sees this person changed. His color has changed, his walk has changed, you can see this light on this person's face. So he gets really upset, he's extremely upset. <laughs> and he says to this person that, it seems that you've, leave, you've left the, the religion of your forefathers. And he becomes so upset that he's ready to hit him. So Usaid bin Hudayr radiallahu an, he says to him, look, take it easy. Why don't you come and listen to what he has to say? So Sa'ad bin Mu'ad radiallahu anhu, he comes, he listens to the words of Musa bin Umir radiallahu anhu, and as soon as he hears the words, his heart also melts and he accepts Islam. And now these two individuals have accepted Islam. Now Sa'ad bin Mu'ad radiallahu anhu, he returns back to his, his tribe, and every single person recites the shahada. Every single person, they all recite the shahada, except for one person. One person, he doesn't recite shahada. And regarding this one, Amr bin Thabit, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, he used to always say the riddle. That the one person who never read Salah in his life, but was one of the first people to go into paradise. Amr bin Thabit radiallahu anhu. He was the one person who did not accept shahada at the call of Sa'ad bin Mu'ad radiallahu anhu. What happened was, on the day of Uhud, the day the great battle of Uhud was taking place, he came and he accepted Islam that year. After accepting Islam, he went straight to the battlefield. And before the first Salah came, he became shaheed. Before the first Salah came, he became shaheed. So Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu say, who was the first, who was the person that never prayed Salah in his entire life, but however is one of the first people to enter the paradise, this was Amr bin Thabit radiallahu ta'ala. So now the people were set in Makkah Mukarramah, in Medina Munawwara, great, so many people are accepting Islam. And what happened is that, there, this person by the name of Asad bin Zarara radiallahu ta'ala, and he was also one of the first to accept Islam from Medina Munawwara, he gathered everyone together and he said to the people, that, look, we have Christians and Jewish people living in our community. The Jewish people gathered together on their Sabbath, Sabbath meaning, Sabbat, Sabbat meaning, Saturday. They gathered, they gathered together on Saturday. And, now one thing to keep in mind, that we just mentioned Saturday, and I mentioned this when we were doing tafsir in the, in the month of Ramadan too, that we should try to avoid using the common Christian names, or the, not even Christian, the pagan names that are given to the days of the week. Because there's kufr and shirk full in all these names. Come, you know the names that we use for the days of the week? Actually, there's kufr and shirk full in all of these names. We should refer to the days as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam refer to the days by numbers. In Christianity, you look in the Bible for example, when Isa alayhi salam would refer to the days, how would he refer to the days by? Numbers. On the first day, this happened. On the second day, this happened. On the third day, this happened. In Arabic, how do you refer to Monday? On Sunday? Ahad. Ahad, Ahad means? First, how do you refer to the Monday? Ithnain. Ithnain means two. How do you, what do you say for Thursday? I'm sorry, Tuesday? Thulatha. The third day. And then, um, to Arabic, um, Wednesday is? 
Arbi'ah, which means the fourth day. Third day is Khamisa, which means the fifth day. And then Yawm al and Yawm al Because these days, I'm not saying it's kufr or haram. The ulama have, have, have did, you know, lengthy discussions on it. But khair, because it's such a common, you know, the names are so common now, and they've actually left their actual essence. But however, we should try to refer to names by their numbers and the way Islam has referred to them by. Because for example, if we look at their names, why is Friday actually Friday? Friday in the pagans, especially in the Greek, um, they, they referred, they had a god by the name of Frida. So Frida, that was the day they worshipped her, it became Friday. Saturday was Saturn's day. That was the day they worshipped Saturn. Sunday was the day they worshipped the sun. Moon day, Monday, sorry, was the day they worshipped the moon. So each day was actually labeled after the, after their, after their pagan god they worshipped on that day. So khair, anyway, so this Usaid bin on Zarara radiallahu anh, he says to the people that on Saturday these people worship their Lord. On, on Sunday, these Christians, they worship their Lord. They all gather together and they have a congregational worship. We gather every day five times, but still we should have one day too. So he gathers everyone together on the day of Juma. He gathers together everyone on the day of Juma, and he says, this will be our day. And in the Prophet ﷺ, he also confirms, and in the Quran, the verses revealed, Ya ayu al-ladhina amun wa idhanudi al-istalaad min yawmil Juma. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to this day as Juma. It was actually another name for this day, but then Asad bin Zala radiallahu anhu, he changed the name to the Yawmul Juma. He changed the name altogether that this is Yawmul Juma. Juma means to gather. That this is the day we will gather together. And this is the first person that actually gathered people together for Jummah. His name was Asad bin Zudara radiallahu ta'ala. The one companion of the Prophet ﷺ, his name was Abdurrahman bin, um, bin Ka'ab bin Malik. Abdurrahman bin Ka'ab bin Malik. He says that my father Ka'ab bin Malik radiallahu an, whenever he heard the Adhan of Jummah, he used to cry and make dua for Asad bin Zudara. That this was the person that started off this action, this, this Jummah salah for us. May Allah forgive this individual. So now what happened was that people were accepting Islam in great numbers. So now the third group of people arrived from Medina Munawwara in the next year, which was the 13th year of Nubuwa, at the time of Hajj. So now the people of Medina Munawwara met the Prophet ﷺ how many times? Three times. The first time was by coincidence in which year? 11th year. Then they came intentionally, 12 of them, in which year? So this when they came to the Prophet ﷺ, they did bayat and they take allegiance at the hands of the Prophet ﷺ. This is referred to in Arabic as bayat i aqbay ula This is what it is referred to. And then the 13th year, they came for the third time intentionally again to take, a, to take allegiance at the hands of the Prophet ﷺ. This time, 75 of them came. How many? This is a very big number. 75 people came to the Prophet ﷺ and they took bayat together. This is called bayat al-Uqbay thani Now these people, they accepted Islam and now what happened was they said to the Prophet ﷺ that we can't see you being tortured here. Madinah Manawara is set. Everyone has accepted Islam there. This is the place where you should set as your home. So they invited the Prophet and the companions that come to Medina Manawara. And they headed back to Medina Manawara. Now the Prophet in his dreams, just as before he became Prophet, what was happening before the Prophet became Prophet? He was seeing? He was seeing dreams. Remember we mentioned this? That before Prophet was given the Quran, what was the first thing it all started off by? By Ru'ya Saliha, by true dreams. So now before the Hijrat, what happened was the Prophet started seeing dreams. He started seeing the date palm trees. He started seeing everyone being Muslim there. He started seeing the land of Medina Munawwara. And he realized that this was the very same land that he stopped in at the, in the night of Mi'raj. Remember we mentioned? When the Prophet went for Mi'raj on the Burraq, where did he stop first? In Medina Munawwara. He prayed to Rakat there. And Jibreel alayhi salam said that a day will come that you will migrate here. So he matched everything that this was Medina Munawwara where they had to migrate to. So now he tells the companions that slowly, slowly, secretly, start migrating from Makkah Mukarramah to Medina Munawwara. Set off now. Because how many years did the Prophet ﷺ live in Medina Manawara? How, uh, what, what, at what age did the Prophet ﷺ migrate? 53, right? And which, which Nabuwi was this when, they, when, the third, when the third batch came? 13. So how old was the Prophet ﷺ? It matches, right? The Prophet ﷺ left Makkah Mukarramah at the age of 53. The third group came in the 13th year of Nabuwa, meaning at the age of when the Prophet ﷺ was 53 years old. So the years match now. The time had come. So the Prophet ﷺ, he tells the people, that slowly, slowly head off from Makkah Mukarramah to Medina Manawara. So the first person that took the initiative to migrate from Makkah Mukarramah to Medina Manawara, his name was Abu Salma. Now I'm sure everyone's already forgot who Abu Salma was. We mentioned his name in the second or third lecture of ours. He was he was a nursing brother of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If you recall, Abu Salma was the the brother who nursed from the same mother as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So now this Abu Salma he took the initiative to migrate. Abu Salma his wife's name was. Umm Salma. And Umm Salma, who was she? Let's see who can get this right. 
She later became the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. So Umm Salma, Abu Salma and their child, these were the first three people that took the, that took the opportunity to migrate from Makkah Mukarramah to Madinah Munawwara. When they went for the migration, what happened was, Umm Salma's family found out. So they captured. They said to Abu Salma, you can go if you want to, we're not going to let our daughter go. Now Abu Salma's family, they took their child, Abu Salma's child, their, grand, their grandchildren, they took their grandchild, they took Abu Salma's child away. They said, we're not going to give you the child either. If you want to go, you go alone. Your child can't go, your wife can't go, you go on your own self. So now he thinks to himself, what should I do? Now someone has to start off the trend of migrating. Otherwise if no one takes the first step, no one's going to migrate. So he says, let my wife stay behind, I'll sacrifice my wife. Let my child stay behind, I'll sacrifice my child, but I will be the first person to take this honor, to leave everything behind and migrate to Madinah Manawara. And he marches alone and he arrives in Madinah Manawara. When he arrives there, what happens? His wife, Umm Salma radiallahu anha, every day she steps out into the valley, and she steps out of her, her house to the outskirts of Makkah Mukarrama, and she stands there and she cries and cries and cries to leave Makkah Mukarrama and take her child and reach her, meet with her husband again. She cries like this for one full year. Until family, family, one of her uncles, they say that we can't keep her like this and torture her like this for the rest of her life. Let her go. At the end of the day, she is married. Her husband is there. It's their responsibility. Let them do what they want to. And they take permission from the from the from the from Abu Salma's family. They take the child. They send. The, they gather. They gather. They gather the child together with the mother, and they say, "Go do what you want to." So Miss Salma, radiallahu anha, along with the child, she says, "If there's no one here that's going to take me, I'll travel alone." And she sets off alone to Makkah, Madinah Manawara. She travels, travels, travels until finally she arrives in Madinah Manawara. When she arrives in Medina Manawara, now slowly, slowly, everyone's secretly migrating. What's happening to everyone's? Secretly, they're migrating. Until the time comes for who? Umar radiallahu anh. When his turn comes, when he decides to make the migration, he steps into the haram, and he says to the people there, that everyone gathered together. He gathered everyone together. I have something to say. So all the people of Quraysh, they all gathered together. Now they heard that Umar radiallahu anh had accepted Islam. All together they had their grief against this individual. Umar radiallahu when he stands there, he withdraws his sword and he hangs it over his shoulder like this. He hangs his shoulder over his shoulder. And he says that, my friends and my fellow companions have been migrating from Makkah to Madinah Manawara secretly. But Umar does nothing in secrecy. I announce that now I am going to migrate from Makkah to Madinah Manawara. And as we say in Urdu, this ni apne maa kadut piya wa aake That whoever has the guts to stop me, let me see you behind the, this little valley here, behind the Kaaba and Haram. Come and stop me there if you have the guts to. If you're going to, step behind. And what does he say? That whoever wishes to leave their wife as a widow, whoever wishes that the child tomorrow wakes up as an orphan, come and meet me behind in this, in this, little, in this area here, and you can see if you can stop me, I'll leave you behind there. Umar radiallahu anh, he marches with a group of companions to Madinah Manawara. Slowly, slowly, everyone's migrating until now, Three people remain in Makkah Mukarrama. Three companions of the Prophet ﷺ. There were a handful of them, but you know, mainly there were three companions that were left. The three that were left were the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Ali radiallahu anhu. These were the three that were actually left in Makkah Mukarrama that were still intending to leave. They were also the family of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, his daughter who served, who gave them food, his, his slave who brought the camp, who brought the, uh, the goats to them and gave them milk, and you know secretly when, once they left. So these were the three individuals that were left. So now what happens is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he tells Ali radiallahu anhu he calls him. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu realized that everyone's gone. There's only a handful of us left now in Makkah Mukarrama. So what do we do? The time has come. The Prophet ﷺ will migrate. And it seems that the Prophet ﷺ will either migrate with me or Ali radiallahu anh. And he thinks to himself that if there's anyone that's going to migrate with the Prophet ﷺ, it has to be me. So he purchases two camels. He purchases two camels. He purchases two camels and he has them ready. That whenever the Prophet ﷺ gives me the, the, the ishara and the, and, the, and the gesture, we're heading right out of here. So he has everything ready. The backup plan, the Prophet is going to come and he's going to tell me. The Prophet is sitting at home with his Ali radiallahu anh. He tells Ali radiallahu anh that it seems the time has come close. Now there, the Prophet is sitting with his Ali radiallahu anh. And there Abu Bakr radiallahu anh is sitting there with two camels, just waiting for the time to be given the ishara, to be given the gesture, and he's, they're shooting at it, they're gunning out of here. Now the people of Quraysh, they all gather together in the place called Darun. Darun Nadwa. 
They gather together in a place called Darul Nadu. All the leaders, they gather together there. And this is an emergency meeting. Emergency meeting, everyone gathers together. And they say that, look, we've lost control of the situation. They started off from one person who stood on that mountain there and called us one day. We mocked him as an insane person, we turned away. And today this person has a mini army. And not only that, they left and they went to Habsha, Abyssinia, they came back. And now a point has come that we can't even torture them anymore. One by one, they've all slipped out of our hands and they're gone to Medina Munawara. We need to control the situation ASAP. So now what happens is they say that the only way to solve this is by putting an end to the whole, so the whole, the whole basic, the, 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 the source of all this, dealing with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa what do we do now? So now they all gather together, this was the agenda of the meeting, they all entered one by one. Now when they all sat together for the meeting, there was an old person that came, and he sat down. So everyone looked at each other's face, they said, who is this guy? So one person, the other person, everyone's looking at their face, yes, we know each other, we're all the leaders here, who is this old person here? So they asked him, who are you? So he referred to himself as Shaykh Najd. He said, my name is Shaykh Najd. It was actually Shaytan. Shaytan realized that this was an emergency meeting, and if there was anyone that had to be there, it had to be he himself. So Shaytan came in the appearance of a human being, old person, and he referred to himself as Shaykh Najd. He sat down in the meeting. Now they all sat together, well, how do we deal with this problem that we have? The first person says that what we should do, we should capture the Prophet ﷺ. We should capture the Prophet ﷺ and we should lock him away. So Shaykh Najd says, nope, you can't do that. If you do that, his tribe people will come and they'll free him. Now one by one, they start giving their suggestions on what they should do. And every single person that gives their opinion, Shaykh Najd, he says, nope, that's not gonna work, that's not gonna work, that's not gonna work, that's not gonna work. He refuses everyone, he refutes everyone's opinions. Until finally Abu Jahl, he says, the only way we can deal with this problem is by eliminating the source altogether. Na'udhu billah, we should kill the Prophet And how we will do this is, one leader from each tribe will take part in this. Because if all the leaders take part, when Quraysh comes to, to, to basically take revenge on behalf of, uh, on behalf of the Prophet sallallahu billah, if they kill the Prophet if they kill the Prophet sallallahu would they be able to combat with all the people of Makkah? And it's not like anyone can back out because all the leaders themselves took part in it. So now all the leaders, they gather together and they agree. Shaykh al Najd says, this is the correct thing to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what happened? This kuffar, they made their plan. That what happened is they made their plan, should they kill you? Should they stone you? Should they take you out? What happens? What does Allah say? وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ Allah. They make their plans, Allah makes His plans. وَاللَّهُ خَيْرَ الْمَاكِرِينَ Allah is the best of all planners. Now what happens? These people, they all gather around the house of the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Bakr is waiting with the camels in his house. Inside the house of the Prophet is Abu Bakr, is the Prophet ﷺ in Ali radiallahu anh. And around the house are all the people. The Prophet ﷺ, he tells Ali radiallahu anh, that today I will ask you for such a favor that in return of this, you will be granted paradise. My favor from you is that tonight, Ali, you will be the one who sleeps in my bed. These people have come to kill me, but tomorrow morning when they come in the house, they won't find me, they'll find you in the bed. And Ali radiallahu anh, now imagine this, he's sleeping in the bed, that in the morning these people are going to come and they're going to start stabbing in the bed as soon as they come in the morning. And who sleeps in the bed? Ali radiallahu anh says, I'm ready to sleep. He says, Oh Prophet of Allah, if there's anyone's life that's going to go, it's going to be mine, not going to be yours. And then the Prophet ﷺ tells him that the reason why I'm leaving you behind, Ali, and the reason why I'm not taking you along with you is because the Prophet ﷺ, one of his attributes, one of his names were Al, Al Amin, meaning the trustworthy. So in those days, they had no bank system. They had no bank system. So what they would do is they'd find one person who was trustworthy that they trusted, and all the people would give their goods to that person. And then the entire tribe and the entire community would take a responsibility that no one can attack this person, because if anyone attacked this person, that means they were attracting the goods of everyone, therefore everyone would defend this person too. So this one person was the Prophet Even through all their hate, they still knew that there was no one that was more trustworthy than the Prophet So the Prophet said to Ali radiallahu anh, that if I leave and take their goods with me, this will be cheating. I can't leave with their goods. So here's the list of all the people that left their goods with me, and here are all their goods. I will leave tonight, and I'll be gone. Tomorrow morning you will wake up, they'll find you in the bed, they won't kill you. 
But when they come to you one by one, return their goods to them. Look at the mercy the Prophet ﷺ had for his own enemies. That when they come to you tomorrow, give them their things back, and tell them where is the Prophet ﷺ? Long gone. He's gone from you. They all gather around the Prophet ﷺ. He begins to recite the verses of Surah Yasin. He gathers some sands in his hand, some dust in his hand, and he says, فَأَغْشَيْنَ Until he reaches a verse, فَأَغْشَيْنَا هُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ After reading this verse, he takes a sand in the mud and he throws it in their faces. When he throws it in their faces, the people they can no longer see, the Prophet ﷺ with the yaqeen and the belief in Allah, he steps out of the house, he walks through their lines, and there goes the Prophet ﷺ. On the trip to Medina Munawara. What happens after this? How does a migration take place? What challenges did they face during this migration? Inshallah, we'll cover this tomorrow. If Allah Ta'ala gives us a chance and the ability to see next week, inshallah, if Allah gives us a life, may Allah grant us all the ability to benefit. Subhanallah, bihamdi, subhanakallahum, bihamdi, ashadu wa la ilaha illa min safiq al-tabiri, wa afidawa wa alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen.